The principles of harm reduction are incredibly important because the people that we are working with or serving or however you choose to describe it are people who have lived through 50 years of a drug war that was based in uh, discrimination and stigma and misinformation. Uh, and so they are already at a point where they can't get equitable care or compassionate care or justice um, in in their everyday lives. And to me that's just acceptance. Accepting that people use drugs, everybody uses something. Taking a human rights and social justice approach begins with how we treat people. Um, treating people with respect and dignity at the point of service. We recognize that when they're accessing harm reduction or other types of health services, that they have a right um, to healthcare and a right to be treated in a way that is um, respectful um, and uh, non-judgmental. And in truth, harm reduction is, a, is an underpinning philosophy of care. It's a way that we should be practicing regardless of what workplace setting that we're in. And even outside of work, it's about how we should be doing or how we should be walking through life. Reconnaissance, en fait, de euh, l'usage de drogue comme étant euh, une caractéristique qui fait partie euh, de notre société, qui ne devrait pas euh, être euh, judiciarisée comme tel, comme comportement, euh, fait partie des bases, je pense, de l'approche macro en réduction des méfaits. It can mean a lot of things, including actually meeting people where they're at, like bringing services to people uh, to places where the services previously weren't available. Uh, but at its core, it's about checking your biases and it's about understanding that your priorities and your goals and your beliefs on what the person you're working with should be doing mean absolutely nothing. It's about person-centered care and it's about what that person actually needs and wants. Meeting people where they're at, but not leaving people where they're at. And it kind of goes back to those little wins, right? It's not about kind of dragging them into treatment or into a shelter or into, you know, wherever you think they should be going. And it's kind of empowering them to make the decisions. In, and in the non-judgmental approach, we actually have to tell someone like, I know where you're coming from, or I at least can understand. And I have that compassion and non-judgmental can translate into body language. It translates into understanding that maybe a question might be leading to something a bit too too personal and really respecting that person's space and where they're at in terms of how they want to or how frequently they want to receive a service. And just continuing that support and relationship and letting them know that they have an ally, they have a friend, they have an advocate. What I usually do is I ask someone, what can I get to you? What do you need, right? So it's always a welcoming type of thing. Um, because one of the reasons why we do this is because uh, a lot of times people will come into the service and uh, they get stigmatized or criminalized. So uh, what we do is we offer an open door and uh, we, we let people come in. Uh, they tell us exactly what we do. So instead of saying, okay, well, you need this or that, we ask them. So we get it straight from our clients. Listening is probably the the most important thing you could do in, in a lot of these situations, right? And I always say that you can't practice harm reduction without doing it in a trauma-informed way. It's absolutely essential to respect the person and to recognize that the objectives of each can be very different qu'il euh, y a beaucoup de choses que quelqu'un peut vouloir dans sa vie qui est peut-être pas cohérent avec ce qu'une autre personne voudrait euh, et que c'est important de respecter ça parce qu'il n'y a pas une solution magique pour beaucoup de personnes. Ça a mis une responsabilité sur toi. Je veux dire, je dois apprendre de eux le type de soutien qu'ils ont besoin plutôt que de penser ou de penser que je sais le mieux. Harm reduction practice um, is evidence informed and it's really important to reflect on that evidence base that underlies not only all of our harm reduction interventions but harm reduction as an approach. Harm reduction evidence has been growing and building but we don't have 
always consistent implementation of that evidence in either policy or services. C'est que souvent ça commence par l'expérimentation, ça commence par la pratique et par la suite c'est venu à être appuyé par des données probantes. Donc ce qui est utile, c'est que ces données-là peuvent être par la suite utilisées euh, en termes de plaidoyer, en termes de faire avancer en fait euh, l'approche pour qu'elle s'intègre dans différents services, pour qu'elle soit soutenue par les gouvernements. We need to balance the evidence, but we also need to listen in real time to people with lived and living experience if we want to actually have the best approaches moving forward. We don't need any more research around safe supply or safe consumption sites or inhalation or decriminalization. We need to start implementing these things and evaluating them as we go because we can't wait for another 20,000 uh, people to die. 